Oh, how are you doing today, buddy? Less than highly favored. Couldn't ask for anything better. It's Sunday. I woke up. Have uh, I, honestly, I'm just I'm just excited to see, to talk to you, brother. It's been Jesus Christ years. It's been three years, about three years. We met at Citibank. You know, at the time you were an iron worker. Um, no, you've you know reinvented yourself. You're working on helping people with their credit. I do want to dive into all of that, but the reason why I invited you to the podcast is because the platform we build, Dream Plan Execute. The mantra is Dream Frictionless, Plan Thoroughly, Execute Relentlessly. Right, and you're one of those persons I see on my Instagram feed who does all three of those consistently. So I want people to you know, capture who Jamal Ellis is, how did you get your start? How did you reinvent yourself? And let's just start from the beginning as a kid on your interest and enjoyment in riding bicycles and carry your weight through iron working. Okay, okay. Um, one, I just wanna reiterate what you just said. That that right there is 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 a, is a nice mantra. I might have to I might have to take that for myself and reiterate it and uh, you know no use it for clients. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, one of my favorite mantras right now is poor, which is uh, poor means passing over opportunities repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So you know one of my things is you know you're not poor. No one's poor. It's just a mindset. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, because of that, like that poor thing, just, it always, it, it just, it's, it's now like the glue to why I'm able to do what I'm doing. Like anytime that like, I would look at a price back then I'd be like, damn, I'm too poor. I don't have the money for it. And right. then like, but now it's not about like poor. It's about like, do I have the hustle to get to that? Like, cool. If that, if that Porsche that I want is, is 200 K, how do I get the how do I, how do I get there? You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. uh, but, but let's, let's go back. Um, and just remind me to talk about my, my challenge that I currently have going on. I don't know if you saw it. It's hundred K in a hundred days. No, I haven't seen it yet, but yeah, we definitely got to talk about that. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. I got a whole group chat, so we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. First, first thing, um, let's go, let's go back. I mean, yeah. we can go, let's go all the way back. All right, let's go. Let's go all the way back. So, all right. So, I grew up in a single single mother household, pretty much. Uh, how it started was mom's. You know, she tried. She tried to do everything that she can. Uh, we right. grew up on Section Eight. I'm talking like, uh, you know, where Fordham Road is in the Bronx, like the hood, yeah. like garbage. Lived in a studio. We lived right. in a studio. We, sh my mom, like me and my mom, shared plates of food. Not only right. did we share plates of food, like I was young, so I didn't understand the idea of like we were sharing one plate of food. Like that right, wasn't right. a concept to me. It was like, I'm young, I'm hungry, so I'm gonna eat it all. Right. And uh, a few years passed, we ended up moving to like another, like nicer area of the Bronx. And uh, one night, I think I was like seven, seven years old or something like that, maybe like seven, maybe like anywhere between seven and 10 years old. And I was like, I went to go use the bathroom and I saw the kitchen light on. And so like, it was like my room, bathroom, kitchen, right? And right. I saw like the kitchen light just dimly on one night. So I just like took a little peek into it and we had like a whole big kitchen. And I saw my mom like eating the chicken bones. Ever since that day, I realized that like we're sharing food and I've been eating all of the food for years. So I was like, all right, it's time to, it's time yeah. to like figure something out. And like, of course it's a young age, but like, you know, I was still like, like we can't, like we can't pr like continuously live like this. Right. So um, I've just always had like the goal of like being crazy, like going out and doing like extravagant things, like the bigger, the better. Um, then we met my stepdad and my stepdad's an iron worker. Oh, okay. So that's how you got into iron working. Gotcha. You've seen it. You saw a presence of iron working. Exactly. 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 Like, okay. I mean, he, he came in and he was fitting the bill. So like, right. There I go, kicking my feet up again. Like, all right, cool. <laughs> let's uh, let's um. So I uh, now let's re let's let's fo fast forward a few years. We're gonna fast forward to like high school now. Mm -hmm. Um, sitting in high school, uh, I was riding bikes, extreme bikes, you know, BMX and stuff like that. Got pretty yeah. far. Got sponsored by a few companies, but it's dangerous, mm -hmm. you know. Like it's fun, it's awesome, right? But it's dangerous. It's, it's it is dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> oh. I did. I used to do downhill mountain biking with some of my friends, and I mean, you make a mistake, you're going into a tree, you you break, you're breaking bones. I mean, it's fun, yeah. 
the, the adrenaline rush you get is nothing like it. But, you yes. know, you know, you make a mistake, you tad one day, it's over. You're breaking that's that up one and that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So like, but just like the mountain biking, you didn't do that alone, right? No. It was like a community, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. So same thing with the biking. That community mm. kept me going because it was mm. like, it's mm, always yeah. fun. But I didn't, like, I still talk to some of the bikers still to this day. Like some of like mm. my closest friends are bikers. But I just knew that like, that wasn't the end all be all. So then mm. I started fighting again because mm. I used to fight when I was younger. Started okay. fighting then got into uh i think i i took i took wrestling in high school and okay. then that opened up the floodgates to me starting in like 2014 no mm -hmm. no like 2012 or something like that at american top team whitestone like oh college. nice yeah and uh i started there and it's just been it's been like downhill ever since then like i've just been like all right let's keep fighting let's do this let's do that let's right. keep training and uh, that discipline was like one of the best things ever for me mm -hmm. because it centered me. And uh, I was actually just speaking to, to one of the fighters at my gym uh, a couple of days ago about a spider web, right? Right. A little bit off topic, but I, I believe that this is no, going to be is. beneficial for everybody listening. Spider web, right? Um, we, we tend as like, if you can just imagine a spider web, you know, like it's the whole ecosystem and then it they build this thing and then it's just that one center spot where the spider tends to chill, right? right. The spider doesn't sit on the outsides because the outsides is where it's weak at, you know, like mm -hmm. something comes, it's, it's swiping that down. So right. as humans and even as like fighters, we have to stay centered, right? So when we stay in the center of that spider web, we like, let's cool, let's just speak in fighting terms, right? This yeah. guy has a really good jab cross hook. That yeah. is destroying my left side of my, my spider web, right? But right. if I center, I can eventually see an opening, yes. right? I will be able to see it. But the moment that I go and chase that that location, mm -hmm. guess what? I'm going to fall off the web. And now I'm in danger zone. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love your fighter analogies because I tend to use those a lot. Um, even with just the Crawford, Errol Spence fight, you know, you could see Crawford impose his game on Errol and Errol didn't have a response to it. He was, you know, he exactly. just didn't, you know, get, get back center to who he was, right? He was right. trying to fight Crawford, like how Crawford was wanting him to fight him, right? And so exactly. you know, get all those uh, analogies that one thing you learn from one place can translate to the next place. For me, I played tennis my whole life when I was younger, right? And I, I actually gave this example on the previous podcast. I was a short, fat kid. I was very short and I was very fat. I know, surprised me, right? <laughs> and and uh, when I started tennis, you know, the coach would purposely put the balls up further than anyone else. I had to run these balls down. I couldn't catch half of the balls. Kids were laughing. Consistency and discipline. I kept playing. And I kept playing even at break time when everyone else was just, you know, mind mandoring around and just moving around, not paying attention. I was playing tennis against the wall. I played until like literally there was no lights at the tennis court until nighttime every day for almost two years. At that point, what happens? Your body change. You start slimming down. People start noticing your discipline and your commitment. People's respect for you completely changed now. No, I'm not the short fat kid. I'm the tennis captain. Became national champion. Then also got the principal award that year for graduating for a top high school. So things change like that. Uh, with discipline and hard work, right? And at that moment, I recognized, okay, this is this can translate to anything else you're doing. You yep. just need to put the discipline and the hard work into it and the results will come over time. Agreed. You just need to focus on discipline and hard work, regardless of what you're doing, right? Agreed, agreed, one hundred percent. And yo, congrats on on you know making that step to being the fat chubby kid to the right you know, captain. You know, so um, what I think Fifty Cent said it best: you have mm -hmm. to be consistently persistent. Absolutely, I love Fifty. He's just Fifty. Fifty's goaded. Anything that he touches turn, turns into like millions and millions of dollars. So like. Yep. He's one of he's one of like my my 
funny enough, I said this in a previous podcast. Look at us repeating things from old podcasts. Right. Um, I said this in a previous podcast. Like I grew up with my idols being like Run DMC, uh, Gangsta Rap, Big Chain, right. you know, flashy cars. So when I started making money as like an iron worker, mm -hmm. what, what do you think I did? Right. You were flashy with it. Right. Exactly. Those are the only people, black, rich people that I knew. I didn't know the anybody else that was like chilling in the background and kind of calm. And and if you think right. about it, any of those guys, you don't really see them. You only see black flashy people that are rich. Right. It's changing a little bit now with like Ernie yes. Leisure. You have yes. um, Rashad out there. And then we know we have Robert Smith being a lot more uh, prevalent in the media, you know, yes. and, you know, he's, he's the richest black person <laughs> and not flashy in a suit, very calm, chilly. And so that now we're seeing that in our media cycle, but yeah, growing up, all you saw was, you know, athletes who didn't necessarily have the best financial um, upbringing, right. And didn't have the best responsibilities or people around them managing them. Mike Tyson, you know, you could, we can name a couple of athletes. So yeah, of course, the, the moment you get your money on some, that's what you think, you know, living is, right? Literally, that's exactly what I thought it was. But funny enough, funny enough, like I listen now, listening backwards, like think about Run DMC. Yeah. Like, yes, he showed that. Yes. But like, if you really think about it, look at where he's at now making millions on the back end. Same thing with 50 Cent. Yep. He showed it, but look at 50 now. Vitamin right. water. Anything he touches just turns to gold. Okay, mm -hmm. another thing. Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. Big flat, big money, but... Right. You get what I'm saying? Like, there was so yeah. many things on the back end that me as a young kid, I just didn't see it. I only saw... What is that thing called? Uh, shiny, shiny object syndrome? Shiny syndrome, yeah. I think I, that's what I grew up with, but now that, like, I've had the discipline from martial arts, as, as we were saying, yeah. persistently, uh, consistently persistent. Mm -hmm. um, and just now just understanding that, like, there's more to life than just the the upfront, like, like transactional, like material things. Like there's so yeah. much more to life yeah. than just, hey, yo, let me go buy the, don't get me wrong. I still want a Porsche. Right. <laughs> I want a damn Porsche. Right. But I know that, like, I can put my money elsewhere than to get that Porsche for free, essentially, because it's going to pay for itself. Yeah, it's just also recognizing that currency isn't just financial currency. There's social currency. Like, yeah. for instance, I was a project manager. You were an worker when we used to work together, right? Mm -hmm. I always ran my job as always building a relationship with the foreman. And not sure. being, not being count everything. Oh, this is a credit. This is not a credit. Cause guess what? There's going to be that one moment where you're going to have one big change order coming up that you could help me avoid. And if I get into this combative, this is mine. This is yours. I can't go to your foreman and be like, listen, I don't, there's not, there's nothing in the budget for this. We need, I know this is a missed scope. Can you take care of it? And yeah. just on the merit of you as a good person, that person will shake your hand and get the job done, right? 100%, 100%. So that's currency because I'm not using financial currency to make that, that change happen. You're using your social currency, the ability that you are a person that the person respects wow. to get something done for free. It's not really for free. You're, you're transacting currency at all times. It's just a different like type that. of currency. Yeah, I like that. That's that's actually like that's that's nice. I never I never really thought about it that way. How I've always seen social currency was just like your social presence, like social media, things like that. Right. Your audience that you have to bring to the table. That's what I always thought currency, social cur social currency was. But when you explain it that way, that's a I like that. That's like a more phil philosophical uh way of looking at social currency yeah because my 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 intention with the the dream plan execute podcast yeah, the, just the catch line is not only just dream plan execute relentlessly but using an athletic mindset and using stoicism in it also right so all the problems that we're going through right now people people don't change technology change the same thing that we're going through now the romans went through it previously the babylonians went through it previously and these stoics or these philosophers recognized they sat down and just thought about problems in life that people come across and they'll you know 
<laughs> your people who are rich who are a lot more stressed out because their mind isn't straight. When, when an antagonizing force comes against them, they think it's just specific to them. No, no, it's not specific to you. Like an antagonizing force is there for you to develop and become stronger, right? So for instance, I'm sure you grew up watching Dragon Ball Z, right? Of course, right? <laughs> the, dif the difference with anime versus an American um, animation is anime shows the struggle. You see Goku training at a hundred times earth gravity and you see him struggling the first time trying to get up. And eventually he works himself up to a point where he develops his body and his mind that when the, an antagonizing force, the Genyu force, when he, get, he gets, he gets to um, planet um, Namek and he's crushing because he's trained himself to that point, right? Ah. So everything in your life gets to that point. You want to have an antagonizing force. How you adapt your mind to it is the most important. If when Goku was inside that training capsule, be like, yo, I can't do it. It's too hard. When those moments come where you need to take on Genyu Force, you're not going to do it because you didn't train yourself for it, right? That's so. true. That, no, no, I want to I I stay on that token really quickly. Uh, I think David Goggins is the one who said, like, you need to put, like, you need to train your mind to have, like, you need to put calluses on your mind or something like that. Right. That's very important, you know, like, especially in business, man. Like, let me tell you something. Like, yes, I'm running this 100K, 100, 100 day, 100K challenge, but... Right. Yo, I've gone a month without making one sale. I got a mortgage. I got right. bills. You know, my mortgage is forty five hundred. Yo, so you know what's crazy? Some of these gurus out there, some of these gurus yeah. out there, like talking about, oh, do this with your money, do that with your money. Like, one, I've had personal conversations with them, and I'm not going to throw shade on nobody. But some of right. these people don't own houses, right. and they're telling people to do all this other stuff. Like, yo, drop your job and do this and do that. Yo, I would never tell somebody. Yo, right. drop the nine to five. Listen, mm -hmm. if you can do it, if you say, yo, I'm done with it, like me, I was done. Yeah. Right. I was, you know, like I've had a couple of things. I had some family issues right. that were going on, but I was still going to keep my, my iron work and I wanted to keep it, but I had actual family things going on. I asked for time off and yeah. they were acting as if like the hell froze over. Right. And I was right. like, yo, you know how many, I know how much I dedicated. I'm talking. I've seen you work, man. You work like a straight. Up, I mean, iron <laughs> work is not easy. This is, we're not talking about welding a, a, a little rail in here. You're talking about being up 60 oh. centimeters, swinging steel, yes. holding together, strapping off walking beams. I mean, the, yes. it's not. It's not. It's not easy work. You know? It's not. And you and just like you said, you know how hard I work. So when I asked for 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 a week off to just take care of some family stuff and i was getting text messages throughout that time it was like right. yo just let me have this week and then when i when when it when it all said and done i had a couple like altercations whatever but i was like yeah. i'm done like yeah. why like I, i'm hustling this hard for you guys like i could hustle i could put this same dedication this same right. attitude this same persistence into mm -hmm. my own thing and i'll figure it out let me tell you something i started a pressure washing business uh, can you can you can see, see that? that. Right? Yeah, I can uh, see that. That's a roadmap to a million dollars, right? Of pressure for pressure washing sales. That right. was my first business. My first month in pressure washing, I made twenty thousand dollars. I put three thousand dollars down, and right. it was OPM, not even my own money. Three thousand dollars that first month. I put a, I put uh, fifteen hundred dollars towards um, I put fifteen hundred dollars towards marketing. Mm -hmm. And I put another fifteen hundred dollars towards a van and equipment. I bought a van for like eleven $1 hundred dollars. Right. I bought a bull crap pressure washer that was four hundred bucks or two hundred bucks, and and I started going out there and I was making money. Every time I made a dollar, I put it back into the van and I kept buying more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Right? Eventually, mm -hmm. I was able to double down that that zero percent APR credit card that I had. I was yeah. able to double down and then I, they gave me like a six thousand dollar limit and this is what got me into credit insane right they gave me a right. 6k limit i then doubled that 6k limit put it into more marketing more equipment more like crazier stuff right right At the end of that month i walked away with twenty thousand dollars in my pocket right because in you had my the pocket yep <laughs> you had like, the it's amazing credit so people it's so funny like 
I always say, like, if you, if your life is a boat and your dream and your ambition is your engine and your relentlessness is the engine, you need to you don't have to make a lot of money, but you need to learn how to not lose money. Invert the problem, basically, right? So why 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 make more money and lose it on the back end because you have holes in your boat basically you're paying off a ton of credit cards you're not paying them on time so you're paying interest that alone that extra little cash around that you could have just pulled together you don't need to even make more than what you're making right now you just need to be more efficient with what you're doing right now you see the spread you just need a spread. And people think, oh, becoming a basketballer or an NFL player, it don't mean they are under the same type of pressure that we're under as a regular nine to five. And yeah, I explain yeah. why. If you making a million dollars, the government coming after you for taxes, their taxes is a little high. So you you look three hundred thousand is gone. Then you have family members coming at you. You're trying to buy a bigger home than your money can actually uh, persist for you to have. No, you're paying for this home. No one ever takes into the consideration maintenance costs, right? They just they just see they just see the home. They think it's down payment. There's actually a a, a millionaire tax when you buy a home over a million dollars. That you know there are other at this in New York yet. Yeah. Definitely, you buy a home <laughs> over a million. There's a millionaire tax. You're not even gonna live that long. <laughs> so you know what? it's. Just, it's crazy. So like these guys get, get up, they go to work and I consider playing a sport at work too, because guess what? They yeah, have to go on Thanksgiving, they're playing Christmas. They're playing, they're traveling all over the place. They're injured and still playing. Right. The gladiators. So, they're gladiators in the Roman days. Exactly. Just they're not look, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get canceled for saying this, Yeah. but they are the gladiators of the the new day they just get yes. paid for it, you know whether and, and just like the gladiators back in the day i mean the gladiators were slaves so let's just not yeah say, yeah yeah, yeah. You know, let's not do a com uh, actual like comparison. Exact comparison, but yeah, I know yeah, what yeah. You mean. it's an yeah. arena people are watching you for that's, entertainment that's right. exactly what i'm saying so yeah. right now that they're getting paid and this is this goes like you said this goes across the board people need to learn how to budget most people think yeah. like oh like let me make more money let me if i make more money if i buy a better house if i do this if i do that they're gonna mm -hmm. be in a better lifestyle when you know how they always say money doesn't buy happiness no yeah. it actually does so, like just to simply yeah. say let me yeah. tell you something i travel all the time i'm flying my friends over here going yeah. to have dinner here thousand dollar dinner there and i'm enjoying myself i don't even think twice about it right yeah. but the budgeting if i didn't budget prior to that I would be yeah. broke. Dude, I make 30K months. If I right. don't budget, guess what? I'm going to be broke. It doesn't right. matter. Most people are in the situation that they're in today is because it's their own fault and they don't want to take accountability and they want to blame other people for right. their actions. But they have to actually just say, sit down, run over the financials. Yo, I know where my pennies go. My damn pennies. Well, you when know, you it's that out. It's funny you say that because, like, being a project manager, that's literally what you learn, right? It's like, you've, I've been tracking people. It's funny. We, my wife and myself just bought a home recently. Like, uh, may, it's maybe a month and a half since we've closed on the home, right? But prior right. to that, appreciate that. Appreciate that. But prior to that, it took us a year to get to the point or two years to get to the point where we were ready, right? I was like, listen, a home is a lot of expenses. There's maintenance costs. There's, <laughs> there's bills. To that now. <laughs> right. Like, it's not just buy the home, closing costs, and that's it. I wish and, it was. And in New York, you're, paying, you're buying a $600,000. You have about $100,000 to put into it to make it decent. It's not like you're buying it in Texas. You're getting brand new marble countertop. Everything's done. No, nah, it's so complicated, man. Jesus, get fixed. And you, <laughs> boiler needs to get changed. You know, you open up the wall. There's mold or something else. You buying homes from built in the 1980s, and now it's funny because we worked in construction. Now we're on the owner side of it, so everything is a change order. I'm like, come on, man, you can yeah, do that. Yeah, that's exactly what it's a damn change order. Every time I turn around, I'm like, 
God damn it. Can it <laughs> right. stop? Please, like, just, just give me a break. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. But before we got to that point, you know, you know, we had our own credit card um, debt that we need to resolve, right? We recently got married, and I said, babe, let's just take the numbers off the credit cards, put it in an Excel sheet. We're going to snowball everything. I'm not going into buying a home with credit card debt because the home is going to take so much money that we're going, especially with this high interest rate environment, we need to be ready. So we took you know, Excel sheet I found on Google and every same thing I would do at work every two weeks after we get paid, we have a two week parchment investment meeting between myself and my wife, like sitting down. Yeah. And we're going to attack these credit cards together. So we're going to pick one and instead of it being your credit card, my credit card is our credit card. And we're going to allocate money to one credit card and we're going to bully it and pay it off one at a time. It yep. got so aggressive that Chase actually called her one day and be like, are you making these payments? They were like, yeah. Because they already have you in a profile of what yep. your, your spending pattern is and what you're going to allocate. So yep. you're just always paying the minimum and now you're going three, four, five times the minimum. They're yep. like, all right, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Stop, stop, stop. You're messing with it, my money, you know, right? Yo, it's funny that you say that. It's funny that you say that. Most people don't know that, like, if you just paid $1 over the minimum balance, you won't mm -hmm. get flagged in the system. Mm. Yeah. So, like, like you said, you're, you're, you're an algorithm of late payment, not late payments, but minimum payments. So you're, right. you're allocated to this one section with a bunch of people that are just making late payments. Just like you said, right. once you, once you start maximizing those payments, four X in the payments, they're going to be like, Hey, is this really you? Is this, you know, like what's going on? Because right. think about it, you're taking away their interest payment. Yeah, they like that. They, no, they don't Yo, like it. They're they so sad. You see, there's sometimes we made payments and they're like, no, nah, um, we didn't process it. Like, it didn't get processed. Like, stop. Mm. Like, it's us. Uh -huh. It's definitely, uh, is it uh -huh. fraudulent? Why would, why would anybody want to pay off our debt? Like, obviously, it's us, right? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. But, but yeah, yeah. That, that's a good strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you, did you also, uh, did you look at the credit cards, um, the... Interest payment. Sorry, I was drawing a blank. Did you look at the interest payments and you attack those first? So you can do avalanche or snowball. Um, so avalanche, you would do the highest interest rate card first, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But mentally, especially when you are, um, it's building that cons like we said, building that consistency and discipline. And like if I'm getting someone in the gym the first time, I'm going to make them do things that they can immediately see results, so they can get captured. And then you can start refining it. And like, so for instance, I, you could kill someone with squats. Yes, it's the most effective workout, but when they're walking around two, three weeks in pain, they, they're not really going to want to come back to the gym, right? Let's just blow up the arms a little bit to get you. It's more about building that consistency for me and getting you in a momentum based environment where you feel obligated to do it now because you feel good about it. So I was okay with paying a little bit more interest just to build that consistency between myself and my teammate, which would be my wife, right? So I was like, listen, we're in a snowball. Yeah, we could take on the other car that's a lot more interest and more money, but it wouldn't feel like it's just draining and it's not getting done. Very true. Very so, true. Very true. Very true. I, I did take the 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 harder route, essentially. I right. did I straight. I, I I made my mistakes. Look, I, I the reason why I'm good at credit now is because mm -hmm. I've been in most of everybody's shoes. I've had collections. I've had charge-offs. I've had late right. payments. I've had it all. Let me tell you something. Yeah. I've had it all to the point that when I went to buy my house, right, mm -hmm. I paid a company $4,000 to fix my credit. And people, mm -hmm. people say like, oh, $1,000 is too much. Yo, when the guy told me 4000 and I looked at the hindsight of how much I would be saving in comparison right. to what this 4K is, that 4K is nothing. That 4K right. means that's pennies um, on the dollar in comparison 100%. to what a house at 500K. I mean, 500 credit score at a $500,000 house. Pennies 100%. on the dollar. A hundred percent. This is this is what happened. If he was true to his word, 
Mm-hmm. I would have been ecstatic. I wouldn't be a credit person today. I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. I'd be buying. I I probably would just be an iron worker still. To be one hundred percent honest with you, I'd probably still just be an iron worker. Paid him his four Gs. I went to the closing table, right? I, when mm-hmm. I paid him six seventeen credit score. Okay. Right. right. Six seventeen when I paid him. When I went to the closing table, well. Well, not to the closing table, but like when I got like approved for the loan and all that stuff, which now yeah. I've given him like a year to fix my credit. You're right. Six fifty seven. Yeah, you could have done you could do the work yourself. You didn't do anything. That four thousand could have gone in that card. You just my grabbed the money. <laughs> he just grabbed my money and ran off. So I was like, yeah. yo, I'm gonna buy this house at a six fifty. It is what it is. Like I'm, yeah. I just got to deal with it. I'm right yeah. here. I put the earnest money down. I'm. I'm. There's no yeah. backing out. Yeah, yeah closing at that point. Yeah, there's no turning back. At this you point. know, there's no exactly. I'm yeah. here, so yeah. I bought it. You know, I didn't get the best rate for that time. I got a great rate in comparison to today's rate. Oh, don't worry. I know because I just bought, <laughs> and I have a, I have something to tell you after you finish your story. Funny, yeah. <laughs> but you know. Um, with that being said, I was like, I'm going to make a company. I'm yeah. going to actually make a credit company that people can like, know, trust, and believe when they see, when they hear or see, I am Jamal GMS, or they hear Grandmaster mm-hmm. Solution, they know for a fact, yo, things are good. We're not worried about nothing. Like, bro, I got an ebook that people could buy. If they just DM me DIY or ebook, it'll, it'll yeah. automatically send, it'll give them the option for $10. Right. Ten dollar ebook. This this same ebook is the same stuff that that I use. I use these mm-hmm. same exact methods. I use a little bit more other things like that because I'm a little bit more advanced. But if yeah. you yourself are trying to fix your credit, yes, ten dollars, you could fix your credit. Okay, and I, I I want I'm going to link that in the show description once we um we wrap this podcast up. But I wanted to I wanted to harp on a couple underscore a couple of things you said. One is actually fixing the credit and paying someone to do it, right? There's a lot of people out here who takes people's money and they don't do anything with it, right? And I know genuinely, and I'll sponsor you and I'll advocate for you. I know you as a person that that's not the case for you. So anyone who's looking to fix their credit, I think you're the guy that you need to come to, right? But Thank you. At the time with myself and my wife, I'm like, babe, we're going to take this on together. She's like, do you want to go and get a credit specialist? No, not to your industry or anything else, right? I was like, most people don't do anything with it. And I think when once I went through her credit report and our credit report, a large portion of it was just the debt to income ratio that was the issue, right? It wasn't a lot of mispayments or collections, et cetera. I was like, once you bring a debt to income ratio in line with that less than 30%, your credit score is going to go up. And if we start early, which we started a year in advance of us buying the home, they're going to see your consistent pattern of paying off your debt in full. And your credit score is just going to grow over time. You just need to be patient with the process. Most people want it. No, no. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah, we just started attacking the debt and her credit score grew easily over 150. And by the time we get to closing, she was in line for us to get a conventional loan instead of getting a FHA, which allowed us to actually be more competitive in this high interest rate environment. People, you know, the home needed work. If we went the FHA route, we wouldn't have gotten it. And because it needed work, we were able to bargain a decent price for the home, right? So you that's, know, cool. that's how your credit kind of stacks onto every, everything else. It's like a jab, man. That's how you start everything. It's your, it's your engine starter. You know, you start throwing that jab out and then you can start um, adding combinations to it and flares to it, you know, but you got to have a solid jab and your credit is your jab in, you know, a hundred percent, man. I'm going to tell you right now, right? Uh, if, if I think 50 Cent also make, said this, the reason why I, I always go back to 50 is like I, I said, he's my idols, man. He really is. 50 and Jay, they're like, they yeah. get it. They're, 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 they're planning. They're not just my, oh, exactly. They're, yeah, they're thinking and executing. Yeah, 50 is That's the goal. The thing. It's the execution part. Most, most of us, we, we lack, we'll, we'll, we'll just read, we'll, we'll do this, we'll do that, but we'll lack mm-hmm. on the execution part. One thing that 50 Cent said was, if, if I gave you a million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And I gave you a weekend to to double it. 
how would you do it? Right? Would you start a business? You know, would you would you sell it on the street? Would you do this? Would you do that? Right? What he literally said was walk into a bank and get credit, put that down with more credit, right? Put that down, show them that you have a million dollars. And with good credit, you can get you can double that money. Because you have good credit, plus you got the money sitting right there. So like, yep. like you said, having good credit is is something that's so leverageable that people just continuously put on a back burner until it's important. Right. Don't wait until it's needed because fixing someone's credit is not an overnight thing. Like, okay, right. let's say if it's debt to income ratio, right? And if yeah. you have a bunch of it, debt to income ratio is a little bit different than credit card debt, right? Because debt right. to income is your total allotted loans, everything, right? So when you yes. buy a home, that's debt to income. But let's just say you credit, are- Credit utilization, right? Yeah, so credit utilization. Let's say that. That's 35% of your credit history, right? No, sorry, right. it's 30 It's thirty percent of your of your credit uh, breakdown, right? Oh, breakdown, yeah. Yeah, so it's being that credit utilization is 30% of your breakdown. Let's just say you needed to do something very, very quick, right? Mm-hmm. And you needed to get rid of that utilization, right? Right. When in doubt, get a loan, right? And this mm-hmm. is not financial advice ever. I do not give financial advice to anybody, but this is something that I've done so I can vouch for this, this process, right? Mm-hmm. If your credit utilization is extremely high, you can always take out a loan to then take down those credit utilization. Now, your utilization yeah. is going to drop because loans do not come up as utilization. Mm-hmm. There's just... Know. Yeah. So there you go. Like it, that's, yeah. that's a quick strategy that you can use to get out of like a hole. And I've done it. I've done it yeah. in the past. You know, like I've had crazy utilization out there because I was young and yeah. dumb. I mean, you know what they, doing. That, that's what these are um, like so far. You can take out a so far loan, right? Yeah. It's the lower tally- interest rate than um, most of your credit cards, right? It's usually 11. I don't know what it's now, but you could take out a so far loan. It's probably 11%. Your credit yeah. card is at 22. So you have spread. You're literally going to pay less interest, right? You consolidate all of those. And if you're disciplined with the money, when you get it, you pay off all those cards. You just corporate bomb them. I know you only have one payment. So you've consolidated all your loans. Um, mm-hmm. Part of your credit score is you paying it off completely 100%. Yep. And and the bank knows it and everyone knows you paid it off to zero. So sometimes like when we were doing our our credit fix and I we got to like a five hundred dollars, she's like, Okay, we can move to the next car. I'm like, No, you're paying it to zero. Zero. I want them to know you punch them in the mouth, right? It's done. <laughs> <laughs> nah, this is mine. Get out of here. <laughs> You're done. You move to the side. You're going for yeah. the next one, right? And it's like people let life. Um, you use the squat. You squat and you lift. When you're lifting, you, the weight isn't pressing you. You're 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 moving the earth away from you, right? You're yes. not. You're, you're you're pushing it. It's not crushing you. You're pushing back, right? And I think when people deal with credit or finances. They, they 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 fall under this pre- impression in their mind that they're getting crushed by it. Whereas yeah. there's always a good move, even when you're in a bad position, right? Yeah. You play chess? No, I don't. But I used to oh. I used to box. But yeah, and I be I used to play checkers. I mean, I never oh, okay, played chess okay. before. The reason the reason why I ask is because yeah. in that, in that exact statement that you said, there's there's always the best move, even in mm-hmm. the, in the worst. Like I play chess, right? And I'm not. Okay. The, Best at it, but I do play it. Right. Um, in any situation, right? The reason why I love chess is because it holds you accountable. You could be doing amazing from day one. Think right. about our life, right? Our life. Yeah. We could be yep. doing amazing from day one. I'm talking no credit card debt, no, no anything, right? Right. Oh crap! I just moved my my bishop to e5, right? Mm-hmm. And now I just messed everything up, right? Right. Right. And now I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh man, I was doing so great. Now my yeah. queen's open, you know, like just yep. great stuff like how the board is, whatever. Now my queen's mm-hmm. open. Now my my king could be, you know, can be checked. Mm-hmm. Oh, how did I how did I miss that? Now, yep. now the board is crumbling, right? Yep. Just because the board is crumbling, that doesn't mean you have to accept defeat. Accepting defeat, bankruptcy. Right. right? You can, and this is not you as in you, but this is a general mm-hmm. you. Um Anybody in this situation, there's the best move for that moment. Hey, yes, I may lose at the end of this, 
Yeah. But I'm going to go fighting. So you know what? Let me find the best position, the best move. Maybe if I move my pawn here, I can hopefully get back on track, you know? Yep. Yeah. So that, that, I mean, I do, that's, that's what I got to say. That's my analogy for chest and life. No, I like <laughs> it because like I used to do, and I want to get back into it. I used to do jujitsu and you, you could be, you know, passing people guard. You could be doing the most, racking up points and then you left your head reckless. And someone grabs you with a thing, and you're like, <laughs> "No, no, you don't move from dominating to going to sleep, right?" Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And it's just like that. And it's the same thing with life. Yeah, same thing with life. Same thing with life. You did, you did, you, you do, you did have a couple other questions on the on the board. Would you? Would you? Yeah, would you yeah. No, absolutely. No, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is like, obviously, you know, you're an iron was an iron worker. You moved into credit. How did you go about reinventing yourself? Like, what was the process of people even seeing you from being an iron worker to know, okay, you, you're managing credit, but you used to put up steel. That's a tough transition. It's not like you studied finance. Like, how did you go about um, transitioning into that role? It's a hard question to answer. I know. <laughs> um, I guess the best way to answer it is just jumping in it yeah right. that's it like it is what it is like you know like people like sadly enough look i i, I miss my iron worker brothers i miss every single one of them i they they were like family to me right mm -hmm. and i still talk to some of them i still talk to some mm -hmm. of them but there's a lot of them that i don't talk to you know because mm -hmm. i left iron work to pressure wash but little do they know I made 90k in three months right <laughs> so like who are you talking to you know right, like right, I don't right. care. like you could be mad at me or not or you could just be like another thing is is uh another another good quote that i've heard it's uh if you have a problem with me but you don't have my number you don't really have a problem with me right All right so how how i like to look at it is is like they don't have my number like right. be as mad as they want at me they just have my instagram so right. like Am I going to allow somebody to kind of like put me down mentally because of a lifestyle that I used to live? Mm -hmm. You know, like we were put on this earth to create essentially, right? Like that's yeah. really what we were. Like if you put up your, your, your fingers, right? Mm -hmm. you, ha you and I don't have the same fingerprints, right? Of course, yeah. So there is no exact blueprint that you can take or and give me to, for me to achieve the lifestyle that I want. Right. So in order for me to achieve the lifestyle that I wanted, I knew that at some point I had to leave Ironwork. As much as I loved it, loved I it. knew that that blueprint was never going to make me a millionaire. Yes. Right. So right. I, I have to create the lifestyle that I want. And I'm doing that now. So the transition isn't more or less of oh my God, I am afraid mm -hmm. because it, I'm afraid of what they think. It was right. never that. It was more or less, I had to face my fear and my own mental like ceiling. Right. That's mm -hmm. all it was. It was just my glass ceiling. Like I had to push through it on my own because eventually uh, what I'm really, what I'm really trying to achieve, it's not mm -hmm. even like financial freedom. I just want freedom. I want to be able to stretch my arms as far as I possibly can and feel no walls. I want to be able to look up as far as I can and see no damn ceiling. That's what right. I want. Right, you know? right, right. So that's what I do this for. So mm -hmm. the transition, I guess, was just easy. Well, yeah. And then also, naturally, you have a tendency to be <clears throat> risk averse, right? Like you did iron work, you were a BMX bike rider. So it's not not a hard jump for you because you, you've always jumped into things and then while you're in there, you're going to figure it out and you can That's trust true. that you're going to do it, right? But that comes to your, your discipline and consistency, right? So, right. you know, it, how did you figure out your, your signature strength? What you knew was like, this is, this is the thing that I'm really good at and I'm going to capitalize and use it to get to where I need to go. You want to know something funny? Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he's mm -hmm. actually like my mentor. We're, 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 I'm struggling with that now. I'm still trying to figure that out. He mm -hmm. he tells me every day, like, he's like, bro, you're good at so many things. Like, you're, you're a coach. Right. 
you are a credit repair guy, you were once an iron worker, you were a BMXer, you lift weights, you right. do so many things. You do sales, you do you do the marketing, you're also doing you you do so many things. Like you need to become stupid. You know, like mm. you need to dumb down in order to find out your specialty. So I'm still struggling with that today. I, I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure it out. I just hired a sales guy. I just hired mm -hmm. a sales guy and an assistant now. So like I could work yeah. on other things, you know? Mm, so okay. I don't know how to answer that one yet. Well, that's good though, because like life's a journey and it's, it's, that's the nature of um, doing the internal work to figure it out. The, the, your greatest strength is always your greatest weakness, right? Always. Right. So, your ability to learn things very well and become better than the average person is one of your skill sets, I would say. And then also you, you take it for granted, but a lot of people don't just jump off the end and figure it out mid mid flight. Most people don't have that tenacity in them. And that's what's going to make you a great entrepreneur. That's Thank your you. strength. That's, that's very important to have because like, when I see there's entrepreneurship and then there's, you can be an entrepreneur and an employee. I, I put them in three different categories. So entrepreneur, very good at jumping off, very good at starting and building things and putting things together and getting the framework done. But at one point, most entrepreneurs get bored of the, the monotony of um, maintaining. So like in construction, you build, in operations, you're maintaining the operations of the business, right? Some people are extremely good at operations, but they're not good at building, right? So just know where you are. Are you a builder or an operations guy, right? Steve Jobs, entrepreneur, builder. Tim Cook, operations, maintenance, keeping mm -hmm. standards, keeping quality, maintaining the line that was already presented by the entrepreneur. Same thing with um, you would call uh, Elon, great entrepreneur, terrible with like quantity control. Needs an engineer or other persons to fill in that those gaps. It's like uh, a quarterback is good at being a quarterback. Don't ask him to be an online person. You don't even make sure. Uh, so if you're you're good at being an entrepreneur, double down on your entrepreneurial abilities and strength and then just fill in the gap operationally. That's what your assistance is doing, right? Just filling yeah. in. And some people genuinely like monotony and consistency and just, I know what I need to do when I need to do it. And if you, what excites you, stresses somebody else out. And what would stress you out, excite someone else, right? So monotony and just doing the same thing over and over, but I know I'm coming to work to do it. i stress you the hell out. I can see that, <laughs> right? So yeah, just just double down on that. And that's where I think your, your signature strength is. Um, one of the things is just like dealing with low energy moments. How do you deal with like, you know, Everything is coming at you at the same time. Life has a way of, and I always say this to my wife, like you have a quiet period where nothing is happening. And then someone and a storm. comes. Exactly. In a storm. <laughs> like it just happens at work all the time. I'll be like, all right, nothing going on. Then the iron worker calls you, an email comes across that you need to answer. Then the internet stops working. You're right. How do no. you deal with those moments? This may sound a little bit like insensitive. Right. And I don't mean it to be like an insensitive answer whatsoever, but mm -hmm. I got a goal. I got a dream. I don't care if I'm tired. I don't care if I've been shot, stabbed, bruised, or robbed. Right. I'm waking up the next morning and I'm right. working. I don't care if there's 24 hours in a day, I'm working 26. Right. I don't have a nine to five where I'm guaranteed money. And I could say that, hey, listen, the storm came. Mm -hmm. You know what? I could take a day off. No, like I need to get up every day. I right. just hired somebody. So like, it sucks. You know, like I, I'm, 
I got friends, of course, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got friends. You know, every now and then we, we chit chat, we, we go over a couple things here and there, but like not all my friends are at the point that I'm at. And, you know, I'm trying to bring them there because I'm not the person that wants to be at the top and then come back to the hood and be like, yo, yeah. to me, that's just showing off. Right. Like, I should bring my friends up there, but they're not there yet. So I can't mm -hmm. bring my problems to them because that might deter them. So right. for me, I just get up and do it. Whether, whether I'm happy, sad, crying, sore from the gym, right. hungry, it doesn't matter. Like the storm comes, I'm, I'm sticking it out. I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going right. to run away from it. I'm just going to stick in it, head down, chin up, chest high, figure it out. Like that's, that's like the best answer that I could give you. Yeah, that's good. And I wanted to, so how did you go about, all right, so let's carry it back to, you know, you bought your home, you know, this guy ran away with the money. What got you into credit? Was it somebody you met that said, hey, you should get into credit repair? Like what made you, you just started, you just, you took an online class. Like how did you go about like getting into credit repair? Okay. Okay. That, that's a, that's an easy one. So I mentioned it a little bit before, uh, mm -hmm. credit repair itself is a little bit different, okay. but what got me into credit was leveraging that 3k credit card that I got okay. for, the, for the pressure wash. And that's what got me in the idea of credit is this big leverageable thing that right. you can get a lot of money on and it has 0% interest. And if I do it right and I believe in myself, that means that I can essentially borrow money for free and make money on it. Yes. Is that how that works? Those are the thoughts that were going through my head. So gotcha. then I broke it down a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. when you go to the store, do you ask yourself how are you going to pay for those, that food, those Jordans, that, that chain, that watch? No. Right. Because you know, you're going to pay for it. Right. So if, if, if that was the case, I should be able to use credit and believe in myself and not question, am I going to pay this debt back? Cause right. I know that I'm going to pay it back. So that got me into the credit space, but my mm. credit wasn't the best. Mm. that's why I only got a 3k credit card. So at that point I said, if, if credit is this leverageable, but my credit's bad, how do I fix my credit in so order to leverage it more? Leverage it more. So you. then I started doing more research. I started staying up. I started going to like consumerlaw.com and just started reading the laws and just start going over it. I started reading up the FCRA, the FTC, you know, all of these things like, I just got involved. I got every every second of a six month span was strictly credit. That's all it was. That's that's every YouTube podcast, every video that I watch, everything that I listen to was credit related. Oh, mm. when this happens, you need to do this. You need to do that. I ended up buying a course, you know. But mm. as I told as I told that previous mentor, I didn't buy the course for his credit repair at all because mm. I already had credit repair working. I didn't buy it for that. I bought it for his ability to sell a room, to grab. I bought it because I wanted to see how he ran his business virtually. It's a learning tool. So I bought it to study. And yes, he has an, an, an AI system that, you know, does it for itself, but I don't know if it works and I'm not bad mouthing him whatsoever. Right. I just don't use it. I don't need to. I don't, that's right. just not my, that's not my forte. Now, Credit repair, right? There's three different ways. There's consumer law, Metro 2, and then uh, factual disputing, right? You can use all three methods. You can use one of three methods in order to clean up the credit report. I personally like to have the ability to have all methods because I personally think because of iron working, yeah. no one situation or one, let's just say, no one person in iron working is good. We're right. all good because all of us, the team. right? So because of that, that's another reason why I bought his system, because mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to have that in the back burner if ever needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why not? Can you go over those three? Like, what are the difference between the three? Okay, of course, of course. So consumer law, right? You're basically, yeah. at, you're a consumer, right? Being that yeah. you're a consumer, uh, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion owes you an obligation to report 100 maximum mm -hmm. um, maximum accuracy let's just not say 100 percent because right. you know things happen. yeah yeah so the maximum they have they owe you an obligation to report maximum accuracy right okay so when they don't 
right? When they don't do that, you can then utilize and leverage the laws that were in place to protect us as consumers to then repair your credit, right? That's that's consumer law. Okay. Then you go into factual disputing. Factual disputing is annoying. It's a waste of time. I personally think it's a waste of time. I don't say it doesn't work, but it's a waste of time for me. I don't. It's right. not a strategy that that I try to use as like my gun hole strategy. Right. Factual disputing is. You're, you're disputing the dates across all three. You're disputing yep. the, the balance amounts. You're disputing the, the, the account numbers across all three. So let's mm -hmm. say Experian and TransUnion are reporting two different things. You can dispute that and be like, yo, this thing's gotta go. They're not even reporting on the, on the right, like how they're supposed to be. Now, Metro 2 is the compliance. Mm -hmm. It's a compliance standard, which was placed by which was a standard made by Experian TransUnion and Experian uh, Equifax. They were made. It's it's made by them. Right. So because it's made by them, they have to work by that standard. Right. Right. So that it being a compliance is was this put on the report the correct way? Is everything compliant to your standard, which you're being the credit agencies? Right. If not, it's got to go. Okay, so that's interesting. That makes sense because at that point, if you're not meeting your standard, you have an opportunity to come in and be like, it's not meeting the standard. That that debt can be can be thrown out. Is that what you're saying in theory? Or when it you would say, just be reduced. What, when what you say, would it, so well, there's go okay. on, go on, go on. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So when you say debt, right? Debt is mm -hmm. different. So the word debt is very vague, right? Mm -hmm. Debt that you owe, you owe it, right? Right, yeah. Of course, right? But the thing is, if it's sold, you don't owe it. If it's sold. Because, yeah, so like, let's say me versus you, right? Yeah. But there's Chase. Yes. You went to Chase to get money, yes. correct? Yes. You didn't pay Chase back. Mm -hmm. Chase said, all right, cool. I'm going to take six months to try to collect this money from you. They got tired of it. They charged it off. Once they charged it off, they used that against their taxable income. So now the debt is technically no longer owed, right? Oh, because they're going to claim it as a business loss on their exactly. side. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, gotcha. But what they then do is they then sell it to me, right? The debt collector. I, I don't buy debt, but let's just say they yeah. sell it to me, right? Yeah. I buy it at pennies on a dollar. Let's just mm -hmm. say the number is $10,000. I buy it at $4,000, right? right? So I got, now I could come to you and ask for $6,000, right? You're going to say, no brainer. I owe 10, I'll pay six, right? right, but right, right. At, what point, at what point did you and I ever have a transactional agreement? Never. Because I had a transactional agreement with Chase. Exactly. And that is illegal based off consumer law, because you cannot sell to non-affiliated parties. Oh, okay. Got you. Okay. So, All right. so that's what I mean by debt is a vague word. So like, mm -hmm. if, it's in that, if it's in that scenario, then you're good. But if right. you if it's not, the then debt, you're not. Right. It's okay. debt. Like, you owe that. Yeah, right. Okay. So that makes sense. That makes sense. And that's why, that's why mortgages are the way, written the way they're written, right? <laughs> So yeah. I want to get into <laughs> I don't want to get into that because that that's that we're gonna we're gonna start some big commotions, but whatever. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean I was telling what it's so funny, like They're also sold, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, they are sold. I, I know someone who buys who buys um mortgage back they buy the mortgage um death and he buys it in his foreign K and he gets the depreciation. He gets the interest on it. He saves it in his 401k. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not going to say anything on that topic because <laughs> it's, it's a very loopholed system that for some reason doesn't, I don't know, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to speak on it. It's just, it's just one, yeah. of those, one of those topics that eventually somebody's going to eventually get away uh, point out that there's some loopholes that need to be fixed yeah well you know what i'll say this though um for me personally when I, mean, I see a mortgage i always try to figure out how the, i can arbitrage that mortgage and i mean i say that i mean is you buy a home for six hundred thousand because it's an amortized loan 
you're not paying six hundred thousand. You're paying one point two at the end of the at the end of the time, right? So, like when people buy a home for six hundred and they're like, "Oh, it grew to eight hundred thousand. I'm making two hundred. Oh my guys, you're not you you you're only you're only getting back the money you put in. You're not even talking about the taxes you paid. You're not talking about all the repair costs that you you did you know, around the space that you need to fix the roof. That's thirty k. Fix the boiler. That's the next fifteen. Fix the home. You, you put all of that together. It's more than double the cost, right? So if you're gonna get a home, it has to, for me personally, it has to be for a specific reason. Like you, you have to know. To me, most people don't know their numbers, right? They get into things, and everyone's excited about buying a home, just for the status of buying a home. But they're it's a broke. But you could be poor. You could be house poor. You That's know what I'm saying. I mean? I'm not a status will make you broke. Right. You know, you could be house poor, and that money, I, like say, f- five thousand times twelve months times thirty years, you're almost over. You can. I'm almost sure you're over a million dollars. You could have had saved, right? And you might not make that money on your home if it doesn't grow in those thirty years to that number. It could. Something could happen in the environment and the neighborhood and it brings down the price of the home. So, yeah, it's an investment unless you start utilizing it as an investment. Like when you get that spread, use the HELOC to know go and buy a next home and like really work it, not just passively have it. Like use it, you know, anything to me can be an investment, even if it's a liability. It's just... Agreed, agree. 100%. You, know, you have a nice car, you're paying the money for it, it rent... No, you just you literally change it from being a liability to an asset. So, so, so I do, I do want to, I do want to go over and 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 speak about something really quickly that you have brought mm-hmm. up. I, me as a homeowner, yeah, I bought my home and the numbers work, right? right. So that's why I bought my home, right. six hundred plus thousand dollars, almost just shy of seven hundred k. I bought my home, right? Right. Um. What I'm starting to realize now is that it's not that I wish I didn't because I, I, I never, I would never regret anything, Right. but I would have bought four homes and I would have flipped them. Okay. And I would have made more money right now. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, right? There's nothing wrong with it, but making 600 bucks a month, it's not going to make me rich. <laughs> no idea. It's going to pay off my mortgage, but like you said, right over time, like technically this house is almost free. At, uh, you know, I, I only I only spend eleven hundred dollars to live here. Right. You know, yeah. so when you do it that way, it makes sense. But there's also maintenance and all the other things and stuff like that. Now. It's just one of those topics where, like, there's so many ways to get into real estate. And mm-hmm. I don't know what's the best way because I'm not a real estate expert. That's just not my thing. So right. for me, what I'm either going to do next, the next house that I buy, I'm either going to buy 10 doors or more mm-hmm. because anything four, five, four doors or less is still technically a one family, like a one family resident. Right. Uh, so I think what I would do is I'd buy 10, more as a door, uh, 10 doors or more. Yeah. Or if I don't go that route, I'm going to start flipping houses because gotcha. I just see it as 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 a bigger chunk. I may even just start flipping houses first and then go buy 10 doors because let's say if I flip my way to a million dollars and then I put that million dollars in in a project, that 20% yeah. down on a project, that, that could be 60 doors. And that six, eight, every one of those doors, let's just say it's bringing me $1,000 a month. That's 60 grand and a in a month, you know, not saying that the ROI is, is, is exact and that RO, that ROI works, but right, you know, right, right. When, the, when the time does come, you know, I, I, I think that's the route that I would I like to do. And I think you have I've a never tried it doing it. <laughs> I think you have a gamut of skills that you could use, especially in real estate. Um, one strategy people talk about is four, three, two, one, you buy a four family, three family, two family, then you get to your one, you kind of snowball yourself to your one. Reason why they genuinely usually say that's the best way to go about doing it. Because you're doing that in New York. 
You can't do it in New York. Exactly. <laughs> it's like somewhere else. Like, by the way, the Northeast, buying a 10 door in the Northeast, I mean, like, God. It's yeah. Not, it's not, the Northeast is not winning the world. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah. that's what I'm talking about. You listen to all these real estate podcasts and they say yeah. four, three, one. They say 1% rule. They say this. They say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't work in certain areas, but they don't not tell you. East. No, they don't they tell don't. you. Yeah. So like when I bought my house, dude, I'm thinking like, yo, if I'm buying a two family, the tenant's supposed to pay my entire rent. That's what, yeah, that's, no. what that's what bigger pocket says. You know what I'm saying? No, that's what it says. So why is it not working? Bro, I'm looking yeah. at how none of the houses are working. So I'm like, I'm not buying a house. I'm not buying bro. Right. Who, and then the interest rate is going up and things is happening. Yep, yeah, yep, I'm like, yep, yo, yep. wait, time out. Like the numbers not working. So like but the interest rates are running up on me. I'm like, yo, nope, time nope. out. Like, I need to buy a house before, like, the interest nope. rates hit 2%. And that's the thing. Like, yeah. they leave out all this information because, yeah. like, Agreed. how do you sell? How do you sell? You sell Agreed. by leaving out certain information. They always say the knowledge that the knowledge that you don't know will be used against you. A hundred percent. And let me tell you something. At the closing table, I spent an extra $20,000 that I wasn't supposed to spend because my mortgage got on the rate. I'm Man, I got yeah, I'm he almost got, got me too. The mortgage <laughs> guy almost got me too. This is I, I. I'm happy you said that because I wanted to bring this up early and I forgot to say it. So when we, like I said, these these rates are running up, right? So when we um finally got the home on the contract, right? First of all, this like try and get a home lower than the asking price in New York Northeast area. If you listen to Barbara, one of the best real estate person, they they always go above action just to quench the 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 ability for someone to get into a bidding war, right? So guess what? If you think about it, lock up the get, house and get an inspection, and it goes but, back down. <laughs> you, can get, you can get seller credits because of the inspection. That's one. When you close that, your number becomes the comps in that neighborhood now. Uh huh. Someone's going to use your number to run numbers in that neighborhood, and everyone's going to run up to your number too, eventually, right? Uh -huh. So you become your comps is ran off somebody else's um, sale price. You become yeah. the comps in that neighborhood also. So if you if you're talking about a next ten fifteen thousand just to lock it up and then come back with credits after you get a billing inspection, you know they don't tell you that piece, right? They don't tell you your mortgage guy is going to want to just not lock the rate early and not mention no. it. <laughs> don't worry. He almost got me. This is what happened. Give me the story. 6.5. Oh, right? I was I put 6% down. I only needed 5, right? I said, okay, but there's a difference between 5 and 6. Let's use that money and buy the rate down to 6, right? He's like, cool, no problem. It was at 6.5 at the time, right? I have a friend, he's in economics, right? And he's also big in real estate. And he's like, yo, rates is running up right now. I'm like, yeah, because I already had this conversation with my mortgage guy that, yo, we're, we're going to bite down to 6.5. And I like, like, always follow your intuition. When it hits you in your chest, I'm like, you know what? Let me follow up with this guy and see if he locked my rate. I asked him, oh, no, you didn't tell me to lock my rate. I was like, what do you mean I never told? What do you think that conversation was about using that five, um, that 1% difference to bite down to six was for? What do you think? You think I was just having it just to have a fun time with you? Lock my rate, buddy. Lock my rate. You know, when I locked it, it was at 7.1. I could have gotten it at six. Or uh, between six and six point five, it went between a month. Between a month, it went up to seven point one. When I was done, it was at seven point five. I'm like, he's like, oh, but it could come back. I'm like, oh, so you, you're, you're stock guru now. You know when rates is coming down, and when you, everybody under the sun knows rates are flying up. Everybody knows this, right? This is not, this is not news. I know what you're doing, buddy. Lock my rate. I'm gonna make it crystal clear to you. Seeing as you're confused, don't worry. I'll write it in email. We're locking the rate today. And if if I never did that, I'd have went to the closing table with probably a rate at like six, um, seven point two, seven point three. It's ridiculous. I got God. 
I got God. What do you mean? They played dirty out there, buddy. No. They played dirty. <laughs> I had a 2.5. 2.5. Had a 2.5 when I mm. first started everything. 2.5, even with my bad credit. But remember, credit rates were at like 1. 1. 1.8 or something like that. 1.9. Right. So like right. a 2.5 was high. You know what I'm saying? Time, yeah. Yeah, it was high with my bad credit, right? Right. So I was like, damn, you know, like, all right, let's just get it. Whatever. Like, let's lock it in. Closing table, mm-hmm. 3.4. Oh, my God. 26 yeah. days later, I closed it within 30 days. Yeah. I closed yeah. it. I did a 30 day close. 26 yeah. days later. Yep. Yep. Yeah. This, is, yeah, this is what they do, man. They sit, they sit and wait. And I told them, I called them all in the email. I was like, if you had the or best in, because I, I sold sourced him because of um the strength of my, my family. My family, my dad is big in real estate and he, um he loves, you know, he had this mortgage guy. So I really sole sourced him on the the premise of like the relationship. So I'm not thinking in my back of my head, you're, you're going to try and like undercut and do these little sneaky moves, right? Huh? Um, so once I got that intuition in my chest, let me double up, fo- always follow up with people. Yo. Always. Like that's one thing I learned as a project manager is don't assume nobody's doing what they're supposed to do. Just ask them because something... Something might come up that they forgot about it. It could have been a genuine forgot or someone has made it. Yeah, or that's very also true, right? So I always make an effort to follow up on some things. I'm like, let me just ask him. I don't want to go to the closing. And like, he's like, yeah, I didn't allot the rate. So exactly what my premonition had is what he was trying to play me with. man. It's terrible. But it's a good thing that you did. See, like, I was naive, man. I didn't know, you know, no, this, bro. I didn't know anything buying a house. Right. Yo, I didn't even tell my parents that I was buying a house. I just bought it. <laughs> I tell you, that's the entrepreneur inside you, man. Yeah. Yo, yeah. I found a house off market. Yo, I was yeah. looking for like two years, two years. My parents knew I was looking for a house, ah, this, this, and that. Found one off market, right? Right mm-hmm. from a flipper. I'm telling, yo, I'm telling my real estate agent, I'm like, yo, they have to, they have to go to my number. They have to. I locked up at 650, right? Or yeah. six, a little bit higher than 650. I told him, yo, 650 on a dot. Let's lock it up. Let's sign paper. I'll throw the earnest money tomorrow. Right? Yeah. That's how it went. Because I didn't want him selling to nobody else. You're right. It was a flipper at the end of his loan, which was a year. So he mm-hmm. literally had to sell this house in 30 days. You're I'm right. telling my, I'm telling my real estate agent, yo, fight, fight, fight for my number, fight for my number. Which I found out um that real estate agents make more money when the higher the house sells. So I, I didn't know this. I was naive. So I'm like, yeah. yo, fight for my number. Fight for my number. Go lower. She's like, oh, he's not going to go lower. Get, yo, get I'll, walk. I'll get, give that 10K up. Guess guess what I did? Uh, my dad, and yo, my dad's cold as ice with it. I'm like looking for homes. I'm in Minnesota right now, by the way. So I'm buying mm. a house in North, in, in, I bought a home in New York. I'm out here building a data center for Verizon in Minnesota. So I'm not even... I bought this home literally on the, the strength of my dad, my wife, and my, my mother-in-law walking the home. That's how much I, but I trust my dad. My dad's bought yeah. six million homes, and you know the, he knows what to look for, right? So he saw this deal on the, the MLS. He's like, he calls me on a Friday. It's one of those Fridays where everything is going haywire. So he's calling me and talking to me. I have the owner's rep inside the, the, the office with me. I have emails flying back and forth. I have a, a trade calling me about meeting him on site. I'm like, Dad, I see the deal, but I can't even look at this right now. Like, it's it's going crazy here on the job site, right? So you, he goes, he's like, before that, he's like, Roman, you don't need us. You don't need a real estate agent. He's like, what do you mean I don't need a real estate agent? He's like, all right. Most real estate agent, what's the thing they ask you the first time is, are you pre-approved or are you a first time home buyer? Why do you think they ask that? Most people who are first time home buyers have never done the process. Once you've done the process, you kind of have an idea of what you need to look for. So they know they're going to get a better sale and can maneuver the client the way they need to once you are a first time home buyer. He's like, I bought five homes before. You, you work in construction. You know what to look for when when 
you, wh why is this spread? You're looking at the deals on the MLS. You're getting the deals now on Zillow and Redfin. You're getting it just as fast as the agents. You're getting them just the moment it goes up, you're getting it on, the, on Redfin and Zillow. Okay. So why do you need an agent? I was like, really, you need a lawyer. That's fine. You're always going to need a lawyer in New York. That's fine. But what's the agent providing you? Why is it that you can't go on Zillow and find a home? In fact, they're hurting your deal because guess what? The seller's agents, when you don't have split. an agent, they have to split it. You oh, come in without an agent representing yourself in their mind already. They know they don't need to split their commission. You're going to be their guy. They're going to want you to win. Oh. That's a game inside the game, right? It's like, so you don't need, of course, there's a little bit wait, more. Wait, wait, just wait, just wait, just wait, real estate. I'm coming and I'm taking everything. You are not coming with me again. I'm well, making my course. 20K back on the next house, guaranteed. But of guaranteed. course, if you go that route, you, you know, you're opening yourself up to a certain amount of risk. Because if you have a good agent, they can advocate. You have to, you have to have, which I don't, I don't doubt that you have that in you. Clearly you have it, but you have to trust in your ability to negotiate for yourself, know the rules of engagement, get your billings, know the process and what to do to get you your price. But once you have that, honestly, like, you know, the sellers, yeah, the sellers, you don't really need them. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to advocate and tell people that they of course, should of course, do it. Of course, of course. You know, but if you can, if you have the gusto and the relationships and the people with expertise outside of having to pay that commission, it's going to help you. It's going to help you in the long run. So No, 100%. I see what you're saying. Yeah. See, like, I, I do have a phone full of realtors, to be honest. I got a phone yeah. full of mortgage people, like, so now I'm connected. So like now I know right. that like people will look out for me. But when I first started, I didn't know anybody. You know, exactly. I didn't have anybody right. to double look any. Dude, my phone is filled. Dude, right now, if you want it, you tell me, yo, listen, call four mortgage guys. I will ring the phone right now. We'll call four. Well, you know what's funny? Yeah. I did this. I taught I taught a, a, a credit a credit repair class um, mm -hmm. virtually to run the business, not even how to teach credit repair. I don't care how to. That's something that I never want to teach. I don't ever want to teach credit repair, but I'll teach mm -hmm. you how to run the business. Okay. Everything gotcha. that's needed. Like I'm talking the assistance, where to get them, how to how to run the marketing, how to, I'll teach you all of that stuff, right? right? But I never want to teach a, a course on how to repair credit. I just think it's tedious. Everybody's doing it and there's a million ways to skin a cat. The moment that you teach that, yeah. Like I'm just I'm just in a swarm. Well, that's what I was saying that a good entrepreneur and that, uh, that's how you're leveraging your talent. It, it's that beginning piece, that initial startup is what a good entrepreneur is like, right? And that's what you should double down on because you're good at entrepreneurial startups. That it, that piece, most people don't, they can't get it together there. So, you know, oh. double down on that. Double that down right, on that. Right there, just made my boy 250K. In, that's what I'm in six months, six months. The, if I bring that down, you yeah. see, it literally says in 214 days, you can, sorry, it's 204 days in a season. Yeah. If you run it with one more month, you get a full total of like 214, 215 days. Right. If you do that, you'll make 250. That's what power washing or credit, that's just on power washing, right? Just on yeah. the screen of power washing. Wow. That's oh, people screen. sleep. People sleep, brother. Look, I got the everything's written down. This this whole this whole office is yes, filled. Your room. Your yeah, room. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. I, if there's literally sales scripts everywhere, there's everything everywhere. It's mm -hmm. neat. It's colored. You know things like yeah. that. Like I got sales rebuttals in here. I got breakdowns. I got memos. It, there's everything. Like right now, watch this one. Right, your environment fuels your enlightenment. That's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. 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 Uh, my my go to one is <clears throat> if you're at the center, of the, if the universe is growing infinitely in all yeah. direction, that means wherever you stand is the center of the universe. Yeah, and you can either be the sun and the center of the universe, or a black hole. It depends on how you choose to use your energy. You can either entertain people or suck energy okay. from people, like a black hole or a sun. So. <clears throat> 
I want to wrap it up and I wanted to ask you this one final question, which is if you were 23 again, right? You was a young gun full of energy. What would be the thing, that one thing you would let you want to tell your 23 year old self? Damn. I know. If I got you. If I was 23, the one thing that I, if I was 23 again, yeah, I would tell myself to be fearless. Mm. Don't, don't let the pressure of family, friends, and other things like that weigh on me to not even, I spent a lot of time like running away from this. Right. Because I thought that iron working was what I wanted to do, but I knew it wasn't, you know? So like I had the mental like pressure of like trying to, trying to do everything else. I wish at 23, if, if I was speaking to myself today at 23 years old, I would tell him to be fearless, courageous, persistent, and hungry. Mm. That those are literally what I would tell myself. That's it. And, and if I told myself then I would be where I am today, yeah but further you know like i would also cut ties with a lot of people that's all right so this is what i would tell myself at 23 i got you be fearless courageous persistent hungry and cut ties with any leech that's it that's what i would tell myself and and i would be where i am today five years sooner i would be where i want to be at the age of probably i don't know 24 25 you know right. like i've done i've done 90k in pressure washing i've done in the last i've done a lot you know like i've done some good numbers within the last two years of me not being an iron worker i've done 200k last year and that's me not working as an iron worker right i've right, right, worked right. in two years you know and i've never made that money as an iron worker. the moment right. that i left i hit over 200k when you did the pressure washing you were doing it yourself or you had you were you, I, were, you, were, you had people too, right? Or you yeah, were, yeah. okay, got you. I'm I like, I was like, I you can two hundred. Yeah, it's easy, it's easy, it's easy. You make ninety k, bro. My boy's doing it right now. Two hundred, two hundred plus k. He probably made he probably made over a quarter mil already, way over a quarter mil. Yeah, no, that's good because pressure washing people need it, man. In the companies need it. It's it's all those smaller things that people blue collar jobs that people, as long as there's a pain. And you're willing to service that pain and people are willing to part with their cash for that pain. That's, that's the gem right there. You want to, all right. So this is, this is the last thing that I would mm -hmm. also tell anybody who's listening. Mm -hmm. Money isn't hard to come by. There's trillions of dollars being circulated every single day. Right. You just need to stand in between it. You don't need to work extremely hard. You need to stand with this person. Everybody wants to spend money. We're in a world of spending money. Everybody, most people can't even keep the money in. Dude, if it sits there, it burns a hole in their pocket. They got to spend it. Right. So <laughs> yeah. find something, right? Stand here, have this person here. They're going to want to spend their money. Results here. Just stand here. Yeah. Whether it's website building, whether it's sending out emails to people, whether it's, whether it's washing a house, whether it's washing a car, whatever it is. Find that lane. Once you're there, change it. Create a luxury system for it. Create something that people feel loved, wanted, needed, and adored, right? And they will stay with you for the rest of their life. They will continuously give you their money. That is it. Like I, That is the best advice that I can give any of your listeners. That is the best advice that, that, right. that, that I tell myself every single day. I just need to stand in the ocean because the current's flowing. Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's flowing every day. Nobody's stopping that current. Just yep. jump into the damn current. You know what's stopping the current? Having a job. And I'm not saying that you can't do both. Yeah. But if you want that lifestyle, you need to at some point build and create something that is current, like the current is just continuously coming in. And yeah. stop the idea of searching for passive income. Stop searching for that shit. That's a gem. That is a gem. Work hard as heck. Work as hard as you possibly can, and the passive income will come way, way down the line. Right now, you cannot have passive income without earned income. 
And then you That's can't have passive income without semi-passive income. And then when you get there, get more semi, and then you could get passive. Get passive. Yeah, that is a gem. That is a that is a absolute gem. Because you look at Elon Musk and all these other guys, they're working hard. Like I don't this like ability or this thought pattern that is like, oh, the money's gonna be passed. There's no passive. It's it's easier than you with spending your time and effort making the money. But think about it as a basketballer like LeBron or anyone else. They worked hard on the court. They 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 went to work. They worked for the owner of the the basketball organization. LeBron didn't make the Lakers or the Cavaliers. He worked for the Cavaliers. He got mm-hmm. his earned income and he diversified it into other asset classes. That if he leaves now he's okay. He doesn't have to go back to basketball as a work, right? And so, remember I was telling you about entrepreneurship? There's a difference between, you know, past the entrepreneur, you have entrepreneurs and you have employees. What's the difference between an entrepreneur and an employee? Uh, An employee just goes to work and and just collects a paycheck and leave. An, An entrepreneur is different. It's an entrepreneur inside an organization, and they're using, or or I wouldn't say using, but they're always advocating. For me, I always advocate for Raman Parchment LLC. You remember, you say you stand between a problem and if the, and a pain point. There's a reason why I'm in Minnesota. There was a problem that needed to be solved. I'll solve the problem for you, but it comes at a price. Versus an employee is just, you know, I'm just coming here collecting my check and leaving. I see completely different. No, I'm inside your organization. I'm learning processes. I'm learning how to maneuver and manage a business. I'm learning the business. When you see project managers or execs, half of these guys don't know how to run, hold a tool in their hand. They don't know how to pull up a door frame. They don't know how to do iron work, but they're in construction. What is it that? If they're not doing that, there's something else they're doing with their time. They're learning the business side of construction, right? So once you've learned the business side, dealing with insurance, dealing with compliance, dealing with budgeting, dealing with scaling, honestly, most project manager skills, they're technically running a business inside the business. They're running a job. They don't know. It does, they haven't thought of it like that yet, but... If you think about it, you have workers working for you. They gave you a budget. They're giving you all the play pen things to play with and practice with their money. At, at their own time. And wow. Then they, and then at that time, but most, like I said, that's the difference between an entrepreneur and an employee. An employee, see, my, I'm a project manager. This is what I do. I get paid, and then I'm going to try and pay off my little my mortgage over time, and then hopefully in 40 years I can get my little 401k and be done. As opposed to someone like an entrepreneur is seeing the processes in the system. Okay, what skill sets are going to translate later when I when I retire or leave this company or start my own thing? This is what's going to read. This is, these are the processes I can learn from this. Wow. Okay. Time comes for a raise. I'm not going to shy around speaking for, or advocating for myself. You have a problem, I'll solve the problem. No problem. It's not a problem to solve it, but it comes at a price. People, every same way as a a customer wants you to solve the problem so they can go, all right, that's done. Every boss wants someone who can solve a problem for them. And they just want you to say, don't worry about it, it's done. Once you can do that, then then moves open up for you. For instance, I'll, I'll end on this move too. I came to Minnesota. Of course, there is a um the job. There's a per diem cost for being out here, right? There's a per diem cost for being out here. It's covered in the company's budget. If it's covered in the company's budget, that means you're not spending your money. If you're not spending your own money, that means you're saving your money. If you're saving your money, that means you can save your money to go invest it somewhere else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So no, what, what it requires of you is to get up and go and venture out of your own natural inhabitant and your comfort zone, right? Okay. You, you leave, you go to wherever. This is Midwest right now. This is Minnesota. You're going to meet other trades. You're going to see other real estate environments that 
you would have not normally seen if you had just stayed where you're supposed to stay, right? So you you took this as a leverage for learning so you can also possibly buy some, ah, see that right there. That's a good way to end it. That's yep. a beautiful way to end this. So like entrepreneur, entrepreneur, employee, who are you? You know, and just recognize where you are. And, you know, as long as you can figure out the main thing is, get spread and diversify your money. However you get to Manhattan, get to Manhattan, bro. You want to take the A train, you want to take the E train, just get to Manhattan. What's Manhattan? Like you said, having the space to move yeah. all sideways in front of you and just get it done. Yeah, literally. That's all that I want. That's mm -hmm. all. I think that's all that we all want, but we just don't. Stress None away. of us are too confident to say it because we, we're afraid to look stupid to those that don't want the same. Then just leave them. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I love Jay and 50 because they just said it. F Jay just said it. He said it in his music all the time. I was listening right. to one of his old songs from Blueprint and he's just like, <clears throat> he said, yo, listen. I'm smarter than some of these boys because they didn't want to open them. It's like, Jay, you're going to be selling yeah. clothes? He's like, yeah, I'm going to be selling clothes. I'm opening the market up. He recognizes you're selling a product. It's just, I'm going to open the market. Yeah, I'm going to sell clothes. Yeah, I'm going to go do this deal at Barclays. Yeah, I'm going to be in this deal. I'm opening mm -hmm. up my horizon, my horizon of things I can do. Because yeah. once he learned how to sell that product, it's still a product. He just moved away from that product and yep. that skill set and did it so, elsewhere. Exactly. And truthfully, right. truthfully, like I, I want to add to that and then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll let it go. Right. Yeah. So growing up, growing up in the Bronx in the hood and stuff like that, I watched the corner boys waking up five, six o'clock in the morning. They sat on the corner and they were there hustling every single day. Right. So there is no if, ands or buts. When I tell you, like, remember you asked me a little bit before, like, what am I going to do? They were there every day. If right. those guys were there every day, nickel and diamond, I could wake up every single day and try to help somebody better their life. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'll give you even one more on that. We're going to carry all the way back to Marcus Aridius. He was the last of the five <clears throat> great emperors of the Roman Empire, right? And he wrote a book called Meditations, right? And it's his... No, I don't have it. I thought I had it. it. I thought I had it. And... In his book, Meditation, is really his manuscript and his, um, it's just his diary of life, right? And he's like, he's going through the stress of dealing with a massive empire, right? There's a plague going on. They have an extended war that's causing a budgetary crisis. And he's just in a point where he doesn't want to get out of bed. And he thinks to himself and he says, as a human being, you have a purpose on this world to do what you need to do. The bees don't get tired. The lions don't get tired. The, the the dolphins don't get tired. They get to work. The bees go and do what they need to do. Everything in the ecosystem is doing what it's supposed to do, you know? Why is it that, no, you as a human being isn't doing your part to getting up, to getting to work? Imagine the bees never did their part. They got tired. They're like, yeah, I'm not working today, you know? So just to get out of that mantra of what's in the society right now, like, Hard work works if you're smart with it. You have to be smart and intentional with your hard work. You that's know? intentional, intentional, intentional. That's the part. That's that's what I'm saying. So, like, you, we, we were talking a little bit prior, and I know you want to go, but yeah. we were talking a little bit prior. It's it's the the execution. It's not just the study. It's the execution, too. Then after the execution, it's not just randomly executing all this random stuff. It's the intention. And then once the intention hits, after the intention, it's the, 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 the diversity of like, hey, listen, where do I go here? And then it's the delegation. That's how, like, that's the steps of like business. And that's what I'm learning. And then after that, it's my price, your terms, your terms, my price. <laughs> that's how you finish it all. and that's the game man I've, Jamal it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast man honestly man, thank you. I'm, 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 I can't wait for people to get their hands on this because uh, it's there's so many gems in here that when we go back in the 10 years 15 years in the future we're going to go back to this podcast and be like uh, 
I remember these young guns getting after it, man. So it was a pleasure, yeah, buddy. I'm gonna look at this and be like, he has hair. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, this is good man. You have a good day, buddy. It was good talking thank to you. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I don't know how to end. Sorry. Don't worry, I got it. Okay. <laughs>